your process. Um, if the screen does not look okay, someone uh, please alert me. And otherwise, I would also like to thank the audience and everybody who I can't see today, unfortunately, uh, for your attention. This is a this is a great opportunity for me to uh, to discuss some aspects of our work that are often hidden. Uh, the people don't see the you know the behind the scenes computational stuff that goes on. And I hope this is an audience that will, um, you know, appreciate it. And uh, some of it's a little dry, but it's really important. Uh, we're also a bit of a do-it-yourself lab. Uh, we, we really cover the gamut doing everything from the mouse work uh, through the molecular biology, the, the data gathering and QC statistics and, and downstream stuff. Uh, it takes a lot of people, it takes a great team, and I, I should acknowledge the, uh, you know, all the members of my lab who've contributed, and I'll, I'll be able to name some of them at the end. In order to put my work in context, I need to explain a bit about what our main focus is, and that is uh, we use mouse as a model uh, to understand health and disease. We're generally interested in studying the mouse as a model for human disease, and that's uh, hence the topic of today is how do we translate our mouse results over to the human domain. In particular, we've been working with uh, genetically diverse mice, and um, these mice have been developed over the past really 15 to 16 years. Uh, they all started from the, uh, the eight inbred mouse strains that are pictured on this slide with the all important letter and color codes that, uh, that we always use to indicate the, uh, the strain origins of all the genomic segments that, uh, that we're interested in interrogating. Um, the strains are very diverse. Uh, there are more than 50 million genetic variants uh, documented in these fully sequenced strains. So at this level of, um, of the game, we have complete genome information and going forward, we always behave as if we know the complete genome of every individual mouse that we work with. Um, the, the breeding schemes are not terribly important to, um, uh, to follow, but we started from the, uh, from the eight founder strains and we took them in two different directions. One direction is after mixing the strains, we, uh, we re-inbred them to make new homozygous reproducible uh, mouse models called the collaborative cross. And we also maintain an outbred colony, which gives us a steady flow of unique individuals. So these diversity outbred mice are really highly genetically diverse they're highly recombinant. And it's important to note that every DO mouse is a genetically unique individual. Everyone is a mosaic of the original eight parents. And because we have the complete genome sequences of the eight parents, and we have high density genotyping uh, tools, we can reconstruct these mosaics and effectively impute the whole genomes of every individual mouse. Uh, I, I just want to give you a little a little glimpse at uh, what the outcome of some of this genetic diversity is. Uh, we get some really extreme mice. Uh, we kind of have a penchant for the big ones. Um, here's a 65 gram female mouse. Um, it, it, it's, if you're not familiar with mice, let's just say it's unusual. And um, here's another rather large specimen uh, that we call the capybara. And all these mice are outbred, they're one of a kind and we use them to study health and disease. Uh, another framing uh, point that I would like to make is that we're geneticists. We're really interested in uh, the, the fundamental equation of genetics, if you would. We would like to understand how the genotype, as it interacts with the environment, creates the phenotypes that we measured. This is the cube, and the cube is vast. In fact, I would say effectively infinite. Uh, there are so many potential genotypes and so many environments and everything that we can measure, including molecular traits, is a phenotype. And of course, we want to understand this and it may be, you know, these functions underlying the, the cartoon may be very, very complex and they may be very discontinuous. 
And we like to fill in as much of this cube as possible. And in particular, where we can't fill in little bits of the cube, we'd like to arrange our experiments in such a way that we can interpolate, you know, between the experiments that we've done, where are the gaps? You know, we can ask the question, we've looked at these 600 genotypes, what if we have a new mouse that has a new genotype, what would its phenotype be? So this kind of predictive question uh, that we can ask if we can fill up enough of this cube and understand the continuity and structure of the functions that inhabit it, um, having dense but incomplete data allows us to really fill out the G by E equals phenotype space. Of course, uh, my lab has long been interested in, uh, in omics data uh, from genomes, whole genome sequencing and genotypes, uh, transcripts, proteomes, metabolites, and uh, whole animal clinical phenotypes. These are very familiar data types to all of you, I'm sure. And uh, these are the types of data that, uh, that we're busy gathering and trying to integrate into this cube. And again, as I, I hope you all know very well, uh, these data types are complex and they require you know, a lot of attention to get them into a shape that's usable for analysis. And we have developed our own do-it-yourself data pre-processing pipelines. And the reason that we've really had to go out on our own and do these as opposed to adopting things that are out there is because we customize these pipelines so that they can be tailored to the individual genomes of each animal that the samples came from. And um, at least when we're working with the mouse data, uh, that's very important. Um, so we can do RNA-seq quantification and we can do attack quantification. And very recently, we got some promoter capture high C data. And you know, we have another half a dozen uh, different workflows. And it's really nice to have these standardized workflows because you know that you can process your data. And then when a new genome build comes along or new annotations come along, or you've made a mistake and you have to go back and reprocess your data, uh, the, the pipelines are really handy. Uh, we have been implementing our pipelines in NextFlow and full disclosure, I do not implement pipelines. I will acknowledge the people who do at the end of this. And uh, I, I totally respect and admire uh, their capabilities and rely on them heavily. So for example, we do not work only with mouse data. We want to be able to compare our mouse data to human data. So we will go out and call from the literature and the databases, uh, particular data sets that we need. Uh, again, at Elucid Data, you know this game very well. Uh, we acquired some human attack peak data from a paper by Cannon et al. And uh, in this paper, they looked at adipocyte and pre-adipocyte attack peaks. Um, when we go to the paper, we can pull their data tables and we can see how many attack peaks they called. And pardon me, despite the fact that they've documented their methods, we can't reproduce this. Throw it away. We do it again with our own pipeline. And then we just confirm that, you know, even though our pipeline gives somewhat different uh, results, there's substantial overlap and even a lot of high quality overlap. So we're not too far off the mark. Uh, the advantage, of course, of doing this is now we acquire data from another human uh, study that was done in a different way and another mouse study. And by processing them through all the same pipeline, we avoid some of the uh, basically anomalies that might occur if we try to integrate data that were processed in different ways. Most of the omics data that we deal with, other than the metabolomics and a few odds and ends, comes in the forms of sequences. And when we're talking about the, the genetically diverse mice, we usually start with the reference genome sequence, which is the C57 black 6 j strain. Uh, the, the reference sequence is annotated with genome features that are constantly updated, and we keep a database that's backward compatible of all the, the genome features. And the same with the variants. So for the key eight strains that we work with the most, we have our own database of the variants and we can use these elements to construct the custom individual genome that we need to do our sequence alignments. 
The sequence reads uh, are aligned to the custom genome. They're captured in BAM files, which we can massively reduce down to uh, oh, throw in the biological sample metadata, and we can massively reduce these down into formats, which is usually some variation on a bed format. Um, I don't want to dwell on this too much, but data formats and structure and cleanliness of data are very important to us. The sequence data usually come in a fast Q format, but after alignment and quantification, we can stuff them into bed formats, which the general format is chromosome start end. And of course, this is all contingent on knowing which genome build and which genome annotation build. So there's metadata that goes with the bed file that tells us how to interpret these uh, positions in the genome. And from here, you can put anything in the file. Um, this is a peak width, a quality score, signal value, and then the individual read counts for the individual samples that we, we counted attack peak data on. There's also a paired bed format that's really helpful when we're doing things like, uh, like high C analysis, which can link one chromosome region to another chromosome region. Um, and we often work with gene expression or proteins, so we keep our gene metadata, which I want you to recognize is also in a bed format. It just tells us the, the key identifiers that we need, the universal unique identifier from Ensemble. Uh, again, Ensemble is really nice because of the backward compatibility. Gene symbols are more human readable, um, et cetera. So genome annotation and variant calls I don't like the VCF format, so we extracted all the data for our key strains into a very nice, simple format that we use for the DO mice. We have a nice web tool. If you're working with these mice, uh, you know, please give it a try. It's, it's got a nice human interface, but more importantly, it has an API so that we can pull variant calls from this database on the fly. Uh, phenotypes, uh, working with the biologists who do great and wonderful work in the lab, they don't always do great and wonderful jobs at putting together tabular plain text delimited spreadsheets. Uh, but here's an example of one that probably my lab cleaned up. And of course, we also need to keep track of phenotype metadata. And I, I know that was a lot and it was very familiar to everybody, but at the end of the day, most of the data types that we work with end up as tables. And uh, there's a data table, but we also attach to these data tables metadata that uh, describe the rows or the columns, whichever way you flip it. In this case, assays in the rows. These assays might be genes. These assays might be the coat color of a mouse. They might be a protein or a metabolite, whatever they are. And then there's sample metadata that we keep track of, you know, the mouse or the human uh, from which this, uh, the, the sample that was assayed came. And it's because of these uh, row and column annotations that we can do data integration. We can do, um, for example, if we have the same mice and the same set of genes, we've done gene expression on multiple tissues, we can get this complete data integration. Um, we can also do integration at the sample level if we've done different types of assays on the same samples. And we can um, do assay level integration if we've used different samples of the same assay. And here, this is all very straightforward if you're working with mouse and you're looking at mouse genes. But the leap that we need to make now is if we're looking at um, attack data from a mouse, and we'd like to attach that to attack data from a human, we've got to take the genome regions from the mouse, and we've got to find where the corresponding element is in the human and vice versa. So again, with the disclaimer that I don't write the network flows, but Mike Lloyd in particular wrote this one with a lot of help from Anuj, this is a spaghetti diagram. I know you can't read it, but it basically is a tool that will take a list of positions in a human genome and a list of positions in a mouse genome. And it uses a combination of positional information and sequence homology to identify the overlapping pairs 
in these two lists. And it'll put them out in either mouse coordinates or in human coordinates as you wish. So the important thing from my perspective is we have this tool and we can put this tool in a black box, if you would, or a green circle. And now to me, it looks like a computational tool that does the following thing. I can take any mouse feature table. I can take any human feature table. I have to make some decisions about how much overlap I require and how much sequence similarity I require. Uh, setting those parameters, I can press go and I can pull out a set of common features in either the mouse or the human coordinates. Um, it's a really nice and general flexible tool. And one of the basic things that we use it for is, for example, if we've identified a, a region or a list of 100,000 regions in the human genome, and we want to know where the corresponding region in the mouse is, uh, the tool will deliver that for us. And in this diagram, these are mouse attack peaks uh, collected on the eight founder strains with their color codes shown. And on the human side, there's some attack data, but there's also some um, chromatin state data, other chromatin state data, transcription factor binding data. And my point is that the liftover tool operates only on the level of the genome sequence. But what we find is when we lay functional information on top of that sequence, that the same functional patterns are apparent when we hop from the human to the mouse, sometimes at amazing levels of detail. So now we have an ability to do data integration at the level of the genome, genomic assay, whether it be gene, which is easy, or just a genomic region, which is a little trickier, um, but we can do these correspondence now between the human and the mouse. We can do silly things like construct queries. And here's a query that I was interested in. I'll show you why. Um, if we take the, the open chromatin regions identified by attack peak in the mouse liver, we have an experiment where mice of both sexes have been exposed to different diets. We can identify the attack peaks that are differentially expressed with respect to diet. We can layer on top of this table uh, mouse genomic feature annotation. On the other side of the equation, we can go to the type 2 di diabetes portal and pull the human GWAS SNPs that are associated with the glycemic traits. We can look at the human liver open chromatin regions, create the table, intersect the table, and the outcome of this is a list of human liver attack peaks that contain GWAS SNPs that also correspond to diet responsive attack peaks in a mouse gene promoter. It's a mouthful, but it's, uh, it's one of the cool things that you can do with the tool. And I'd like to point out that understanding diet specific effects of open chromatin is really hard to do in humans, but it's a really straightforward thing to do in mice. So if you're asking, why don't we just do all this on the human side of the equation? It's because we have the mouse as an experimental organism that we can intervene with. Um, so the ability to use the mouse as an experimental tool to understand the human regions, the regulatory regions, presumably because they're open chromatin that contain GWAS SNPs. And I just wanna show you briefly that in the mouse, we looked at several tissues and two tissues in particular had loads of diet-specific open chromatin regions, 5,000 in liver, almost 6,000 in adipose. And when we did layer the genomic annotation on top of those, it's interesting. Most of these attack peaks are in promoters or intergenic regions or introns. And it doesn't change much in adipose when you ask where are the diet-specific peaks but in the liver, the majority of the uh, attack peaks that are diet responsive appear to be in gene promoters. And this is something that uh, we're very interested in pursuing as we go forward. Um, I've used most of my time, but let me just uh, show one little more vignette that we use these tools for. Um, we know that most of the human GWAS associations with, with disease are located in intergenic regions. And that makes them a little difficult to study, but we'd like to be able to carry those regions over into mouse and build mouse models where we manipulate, knock out, or otherwise change the regulatory elements and ask experimentally, 
what is the function of this genomic region? So here's a pipeline that you can't see the details of, but I'll walk through it quickly. Um, we identify the islet attack peaks. This is in the uh, islet because we're interested in type 2 diabetes in this context. Uh, we have mouse attack and we have human attack. And we do the little intersection. We found that there were 44,000 attack peaks in those two lists that can be identified as being common between human and mouse. If we want to understand what these regions might be regulating, we have this great tool that the genome gave us, these topological domains that define boundaries in the genome that limit the range of peak to gene interactions. So we bring the TAD boundaries in. Uh, here is where we inserted the GWAS SNPs for the glycemic traits. And we're gonna layer additional information on top of this, including some transcription factor binding data that we got from human, uh, some human EQTL data, mouse EQTL data, and I'm just going to say more because the promoter capture high C data are coming and uh, we hope to be able to integrate additional data to help us prioritize. And at this stage of the game, we've again with our four metabolic tissues, we've intersected the attacks, uh, found the common peaks, looked at the ones with GWAS, and then used some of this additional information to help prioritize. We have a budget to build 10 mouse models, and you can see we might want to do a little more fine tuning on the prioritization, um, but um, here we go. I, um, I'd like to say that human and mouse regulatory elements appear to be often, and I'd say very often conserved. We have now this nice reciprocal liftover tool that can establish the correspondence between these genome features, and that allows us to integrate data from humans and bring it into the mouse where we can do experiments that will help us understand the functions of these regulatory elements. And I would like to stop there and you'll see the slides that I'm not gonna talk about today, um, except to mention, uh, I believe these slides are available. So um, some of the tools that have been developed in our lab to build custom genomes, uh, quantify RNA-seq, um, some of the APIs that I mentioned for gene annotation, and this really cool uh, QTL viewer tool that I, I won't have much time to show off um, because I want to thank uh, Mark Keller. He's at University of Wisconsin uh, for inspiring uh, us to build this human mouse um, mapping tool. Anuj, Mike, and Sai, and Matt, who are the software engineers who did all the really hard work Isabella is, is a biologist and a data analyst in my lab who carried out a lot of the, the analysis. And Candace just makes everyone work together. And thanks to Jackson.